All parents want their children to become the best adults they can be. Healthy sexual development is an important part of the journey from childhood into adulthood. In the following segments, you'll hear from leading experts who will discuss healthy sexual and identity development, differences between sexual orientation, gender, and identity, overcoming bias and discrimination, and risk factors for children who have experienced trauma. You'll also meet Justice and his adoptive mother, Kim, who will share insights about Justice's journey to embrace his sexual identity. One of the things that I think is really um, crucial, but also really difficult for foster parents is to understand what healthy sexual development looks like and how they can support that. Being sexually healthy is to come to a positive sense of oneself as a sexual individual with one's pattern of attractions. And the task is to prepare young people for these developmental milestones and, and to speak about the positives, not just the negatives of, of, of sexuality. As early as infancy, children begin to reach milestones in their sexual development. They're beginning to find out where their genitals are, so they may be touching, they may be pulling or tugging at them. As they get into more of the one to 18 month range, they might be wanting to show you what it is or how it looks, and that is all appropriate behavior. So in this stage, remember that the nurturing touch is important for helping them to develop a positive self-esteem about their body going forward. The next developmental milestones usually occur between 18 months and age three. During this time, children may be experiencing um, an exploration of their genitals that may seem concerning to you, but it is completely appropriate. Masturbation at this age is for pleasure and not for orgasm. You can begin to develop boundaries about where that particular type of behavior may occur, making a safe space for that. In the years between age three and six, children begin to notice differences between themselves and others. They're comparing, they want to see where they fit in their gender role, they're trying to establish their identity. So if you have a three, four, five, six-year-old child who is showing signs of identifying with a gender other than the gender that was assigned at birth, that is also a natural time in human development for that to start to emerge. They continue to explore their own bodies and become curious about the bodies of others too. Imagine you have this child in your home that's about four years old and you decide to invite the neighbor over as well and they're in the living room playing, you decide to go into the kitchen and make a snack and come back to find that one is looking at the other's genitals. While it is appropriate development, uh, it may shock you. Parents should acknowledge the exploratory play and then redirect to a new activity. Can you give it yourself? The next developmental stage, age six to nine, this is a time where children are beginning to form what they may identify as gender-wise, sexual orientation-wise, even at this very early stage. This is a great time to start talking to your child about where babies come from, their own bodies, maybe some basic things about sex. Between ages nine and 14, most children begin to go through puberty and may have concerns about their body image. What is important to know is the types of language that you use about bodies and about your own body and about admiring other people's bodies around the adolescent at this stage. This is also the time when sexual attractions intensify and gender identity begins to solidify. During this age range, you may see a stronger leaning towards a certain sexual orientation um, or a gender identity. 14 to 18 year olds are learning to be very independent. They're learning to differentiate between biological sex roles and socially constructed ones and finding where they fit along that spectrum. Engaging in sexual activity often occurs during this stage of development. I think the difficulty is that when kids are in foster care, our focus is entirely on keeping them safe. So what we tend to do is we wrap foster kids sort of up in this invisible cloak that says you can't have sex, you can't date. The most important thing that we can do is be honest with young people and to help them understand the consequences of the various activities they might engage in. The fact of the matter is that if we don't have those conversations and talk about safer sex practices and ways to prevent pregnancy and STIs, those activities will still take place, but they'll take place hidden from you. And so as much as I 
wanted my kids to wait until they were adult to have sex. I also knew that if I told them you can't do X, Y, Z, they were likely going to do it anyway and they were never going to feel safe to come to me if there was a problem. Throughout a child's developmental timeline, they are forming their sexuality and identity. We often confuse what gender identity is, what birth gender, and what sexual orientation is. LGBTQ is right now probably one of the most common phrases that people will hear. So that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or in some communities it could mean queer, and in other communities it may mean questioning or both. A phrase that people are beginning to hear is SOGI, S-O-G-I-E, which stands for sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. The reason for talking about and understanding SOGI is that that's what we all hold in common as human beings. We all have a sexual orientation, we all have a gender identity, and we all have a gender expression. Sexual orientation is a reference to the person to whom one is attracted. And it has to do not just with physical attraction, it's not just about sex, it is about the emotional attraction. I always had an attraction towards girls, but I didn't know how to express it. Do you remember me always changing the channel if a girl was on TV and you walked into the room? No. I did. I didn't even notice that. Yeah, I did all the time. Like, it didn't matter what I was watching. It, it could have been a commercial. If a girl got on the TV, I would switch it because I felt like, oh my God, they're going to know I'm. They're going to know I like her. They're going to know I like her. With gender identity, that's about who a young person understands themselves to be inside. In our culture, we focus on a, what's called a binary system. It means you are either male or you are female. I always knew that I liked boy things when I was little. I hated dresses, I hated makeup. While there may be particular genitalia present, that does not always mean a child will identify their gender identity with the gender that was assigned at birth. It's not uncommon for them to start out saying, you know, I'm gay or I'm lesbian, and then say, no, not really. I'm really not lesbian. I'm really a transgender male because I like women not in the way that women like women, but I like women in the way men like women. I ended up coming out as lesbian when I was 19. And, um, it still just didn't feel right. It still didn't feel like I was complete. Three years ago, I finally opened up to my family about my true self, and that's that I was born in the wrong body. I'm really a man. You are totally boy. Gender expression is about how we express our gender in the world. You can be a straight individual in terms of your sexual orientation and present in the world with more feminine gender expression. Each one of us represent a different combination of these factors of sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. I had a 16-year-old patient and is female identifying, is an assigned male at birth, and her mother was sharing with me. She says she identifies as female, but I don't see her taking on female clothing. And I had to take a step back and share with mother that because she identifies as female does not mean to say she needs to be dressed in feminine clothing. Recognizing your own assumptions and areas of bias will help you best support a child in your care wherever they are on the SOGI spectrum. I wasn't always this accepting. We have to make decisions, I think, based on what is in the best interest of our kids around their safety and their well-being. And sometimes that means that you have to reevaluate your own values or your own expectations in order to meet the needs of that child in a way that's safe and supportive and embraces them for all that they are. 
Sometimes, we're not mindful of the comments that we make about LGBT populations until it happens to one of ours. And all those times that families may have made major pejorative comments about LGB LGBT people, your children were listening. Remember that your children listen. Learning to not say things like girlfriend or boyfriend and maybe say special someone. Is that a special someone in your life? The other things that I think that we can do, especially with older kids when they join our family, we can ask them, what pronouns do you use? It's critically important for us to model in our speech and our language respect for LGBT people and equity a sense of equity that they are no less. We have to be absolutely intolerant of homophobic humor. It's not funny. Any kind of humor that puts down another person, again, is giving a message to our children that maybe they're not safe to be who they are and that we're gonna have a judgment about that. Something as simple as displaying a magnet on the fridge, a rainbow magnet or an allied sticker, making sure that they have a wide range of relationships to look at as normal. First time my mom brought me to the gay pride parade, she was trying to speed to get us on time to the parade. <laughs> you know, she was more excited than I think me and my sister were. And it was things like that that was like, wow, like this isn't, she's not pretending to be supportive. She's not pretending to be interested. Like she really is making this a part of her life. Foster and adoptive children with a history of trauma may be at a greater risk of engaging in unhealthy interpersonal relationships. They are more at risk for being involved in relationships that are like peer pressured type of relationships, maybe unhealthy sexual relationships. If all you've seen in terms of interpersonal relationships and particularly romantic relationships among adults and peers are things where people are hurting each other or allowing themselves to be hurt by circumstance, then it, it's almost impossible to imagine how you would learn to have a healthy mutual relationship, um, sexually, romantically, or even as friends. When children see their parents, their mentors, even their foster parents, displaying healthy affection, displaying positive and kind interactions with one another, they learn that affection is good. Some details of your child's history may not be known until they feel safe to disclose them. We didn't really know all of our children's history. And that was not the fault of the agency. Children will often not tell anybody about something that's happened because they're afraid of repercussions. They're afraid of consequences. So that little seven-year-old that came into my family revealed her sexual abuse history at 16, she revealed piece by piece a horrendous sexual abuse history that happened in foster care where she was told she was going to be safe. Children exploring or questioning their sexual identity in an unsupportive environment can have heightened risks of anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and suicide. I should be a statistic not just because of my history, but just of my whole life, like I should be a statistic. I should be dead. I should be addicted to drugs. I should be in prison. Family acceptance is tremendously protective. It protects against depression. It protects against, it's protective of substance abuse. It's protective of suicidality. And families truly have the opportunity to promote positive outcomes for their children and youth who might be gender questioning or LGBT by affording them the affirmative space through which they might develop their identities. The chapters in my book that I didn't want to read out loud my mom would read it out loud. In the chapters that I wanted to erase or say it's not true, my mom would say, no, it's okay, we know it's true. No matter their age, no matter their developmental milestone, really what it boils down to is love, the love that you show to that child. That's really what they need in the end. My mom loving me unconditionally did more for me than what she probably even knows. Why are you tearing up? Because you make me oh proud and stuff. <laughs> <laughs>